Welcome back to season two of the Radical Narrative. We're really excited to launch season two. We have some great guests planned up this year. Um, we're actually going to be doing two episodes a month that we're hoping for, but we never know. We never know. I mean, this has been a side project. It's our hobby project. Um, and it kind of took off on us. I mean, 150 subscribers-ish and keeps growing and keeps getting plays. We got a lot of plays over the break and that was really great to see, really encouraging. We got messages in our DMs, which was really great and encouraging to see. We're really appreciative of everybody who's sharing this, liking this, subscribing to this. And yeah, welcome to the Radical Narrative family. For those of you that don't know, there's actually three of us involved in the Radical Narrative podcast. And again, it's a side project, it's a hobby project. Um, there's me, your host, Mylon Tatusis, and of course, you know me, you know my voice, you know um, I actually sit with our guests and do the interviews. Um, but there's also Daryl Lucero, who is our creative producer. He's based out of Isleta, New Mexico, and we run all our creative ideas by him. We have conversations about what we're doing and what we're planning, and he's actually the brainchild behind some of what we've done here with the Radical Narrative Podcast. We have another friend, Peyton Jackson, from rural Saskatchewan, also from Kindersley, Saskatchewan. She is our creative advisor and our marketing advisor. She's currently doing her master's out on the West Coast in Victoria. And again, we're never in the same room together. This is all an online project. We're all coming together from a distance to bring you these episodes and foster the philosophy of Radical Narrative to share it with you. So that's who we are. That's our team. We are also going to be hosting apprentices this season. So there's going to be people on board who are going to be learning about what we do and how we do it. And hopefully in the future, branch off and make their own podcasts and, and get their own episodes out there and talk about what they want to talk about. But we're basically showing emerging podcasters how we do things and ideally take our best practices and, and help us out and help us carry the momentum and, and build off each other in good, positive ways. And that's going to be coming to you very soon. So listen out for that. If you want the details of what I'm talking about, it's all on our website, www.radicalnarrative.com. All the information is there, our bios are there, and we will be hosting our apprentices' bios there also in coming weeks. Today on the podcast, I'm sitting down with P. Sean Bread, a Comanche screenwriter and poet and cinematographer. She's up and coming and an emerging filmmaker. She recently had the honor of receiving Sundance Films Festival's Native Filmmaker Lab Fellowship, where she had the opportunity to workshop her script, The Daily Life of Mistress Red. It's a mockumentary short film about a Native dominatrix for hire who whips apologies out of a white supremacist. The Daily Life of Mistress Red is currently in post-production, and we're going to talk all about it here on this episode. So tune in and listen in as we talk about living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, art school, acting, producing and directing films, the portrayal of indigenous queer peoples and women in films, and just in general about natives making and acting in films. So stay tuned and listen in. Awesome. Thanks, Pishan, for sitting down to this podcast. I'm really excited to hear what's going on with you because we've been out of touch for a while. I mean, even though you are my sister-in-law, that you're my daughter's auntie, we haven't really been able to talk because of life. And I know you've been off to college doing all this cool stuff, and now you're making films on the set and things like that. But first and foremost, tell us about who you are. Hello, my name is Pishan Bread. I'm a Comanche filmmaker, specifically a screenwriter and director. And you're currently working on a film right now. Yes, I'm working on my short film, The Daily Life of Mistress Red, which is about a native dominatrix who whips white supremacists to apologize for um, colonization. Yeah. We're going to talk about that later, but you're also working on a set right now, too. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's been... <laughs> really crazy i can't tell too much about the project because of non-disclosure agreements of course but it's mm -hmm. a project that's been announced with amazon studios and it's a tv series so i'm currently yeah. working on a tv series we are in uh prep right now and we're planning to shoot in january cool so you're busy working on set and doing all that cool stuff yeah busy working Great. on set sending out emails zooming um, working 12 hour days, five days a week. <laughs> yeah. 
Cool. Yeah. So you're a filmmaker. We're going to jump into that and have conversations about that later. Um, but what I really want to jump into first and foremost is basically position you as as being a Comanche filmmaker. So you're an indigenous person coming at your industry and your career from obviously being like, you know, who you are and where you come from. Um, but what do you do in terms of work, film and art? Like, let's highlight that first and foremost. Sure. So I identify myself as a screenwriter and a director. Within this field, I've been really into cinematography. I love working with black and white film. And I really love writing screenplays and writing stories that are able to communicate through film, not particularly through film. It could be through TV series. It could just be a narrative or just an idea of any sort. And I'm a new director. I will admit that I haven't been directing for a while. I have just recently got into directing in 2018 and it's a completely wonderful and new experience to be going through. Yeah. But I mean, there's also a background story where you did grow up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and that Santa Fe, New Mexico in general is a pretty big indigenous art community. Um, there's an art market there, obviously, just in terms of like the economy and things like that. But you grew up in that whole like atmosphere of, you know, going to art shows and being around artists and things like that. How did that influence you? Well, let's let's take a step back. Let's let's contextualize Santa Fe. What was it like growing up in Santa Fe, New Mexico? Growing up in Santa Fe was completely different from anything that I had ever expected it to be because I was born in Oklahoma in Oklahoma City and pretty much lived there until I was 11. I moved to Santa Fe when I was 11 and I probably actually met you when I was 13 or 14. <laughs> but being in Santa Fe was interesting because I had met a lot of new different native people out there, you know, going to powwows all the time in Oklahoma on weekends, it was just like powwow after powwow and just always seeing the same family members and friends as, you know, at every powwow. But being in Santa Fe was interesting because I got to learn about the culture and why it was just, why people are so attracted to it, why people find this place as somewhere they can be creative and to explore their creativity. And honestly, I went to the Indian school in high school and that was also a lot of fun too. Very different uh, being the only Plains Indian and being within like Pueblo communities and even knowing the lay of the land with like Apaches and Navajos. I think for me being in Santa Fe is being in New Mexico in general has been a blessing in disguise because it just was able to teach me about so many different peoples and just about the land and of course, going to art markets, that's where I got to find out where each person, like their tribal affiliation, where they're from, what their art looks like. And I think for me growing up within the community and art markets, I used to sell um, my mother and stepfather's work. So I would always do all the talking, which was a lot of fun. And I would constantly meet different people and i always felt bad because i was just a salesperson i people would ask me oh do you make jewelry do you paint um what do you do and i was like i make sales i try to feed my family i was like i don't know <laughs> and my sister is a painter of course and so they're like what do you do and i was like i guess i don't have an art the art of sales is what i'd always say and they buy something out of guilt but <laughs> They'd feel bad and they buy something. <laughs> so, yeah, two things there is Santa Fe is a unique place. You got to experience that just in terms of, you know, a lot of people making their way there who are artists, who are creative people. And then you actually gain to participate in like the, the art world as as somebody who was up close and personal with not only like the art market of terms of in terms of people buying art, but also meeting artists in general and, and connecting with that community and things like that. Um, how did that influence the direction you're taking now? Because you did say you highlighted something where you said that you didn't do art. Um, you were, you were selling art on like you're being the sales rep for your family and, and people selling arts. But how did that whole, um, sort of energy and creative vibe sort of influence, influence the direction you, you took in terms of your career path as a filmmaker? I would have to say exploration, seeing all these different types of 
um, mediums of art and being exposed to them all the time, it allowed me to kind of see where I think I could put my creative energy towards. I know that I always wanted to be a writer and that was something I wanted to do for like the rest of my life. I remember always wanting to write novels, but I think one of the biggest moments was going to Santa Fe Indian market and they had a film festival there called um, class X. It was why it was class X and they had native cinema showcase with the Smithsonian museum with NMAI. Sorry. And, I remember going to see films during India market. That was always my highlight. I was always so excited to get a break from the booth and just to go watch films. And they were all indigenous made films and they weren't necessarily about indigenous content, like indigenous um, ideas or anything of the sort, but they were all indigenous made. And that was something that just resonated with me. That was something I found and realized that I wanted to do. I wanted to make films and be an, be an Indigenous person and just make films about Indigenous life and what it is today and not just historical films. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool that you're saying that because we're going to unpack that later on where we're going to sort of look at like, you know, the historical genre of how like, I guess, Indian cinema existed in Hollywood, but how it's sort of taken this whole new like um, expressive turn where we're actually starting to see films made by our own people yeah you did grow up in well you did go to santa fe indian school so new mexico being this whole different sort of like vibe and atmosphere it is pueblo territory and things like that so you highlighted something interesting where you said you were a plains indian in you were a plains indian at santa fe indian school which is predominantly pueblo yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) so what was that dynamic like that was a really tough dynamic because i mean I was the tallest one in my class. You still are the tallest easy. one. I'm still the tallest. It was very easy for people to spot me from across the room, you know, and it was um, very easy for me to be targeted. I had gone through a lot of bullying as well. And that was just for many reasons. One being that I was a different tribe. The second one being that I was queer and identified and was fine with that. Third, I was just weird to other people. And, you know, it's like I always had creative ideas. I was always just enjoying my youth, being <laughs> being crazy and just having fun. And, you know, that was I was always the target for being bullied. And I felt like that totally robbed my experience of what would have been a good high school experience and to be around indigenous cultures and to fully take that in because I grew resentful for a while. I was very resentful towards, um, you know, being, I was like, why am I at this school? I was like, I got bullied in my middle school. That was a public school in Santa Fe for being Indian. And I go to an Indian school and still get bullied for being native. I was like, this is ridiculous. So (laughs) I was like, this is so pointless. I was like, I should have just stayed at my public school if that was going to be the case. But I ended up meeting a couple of great people. Yeah, and high school wasn't easy for you, as you're saying. Um, and at the same time, you were in Santa Fe. You got to partake in the film industry fairly early on. Um, you actually were a part of a film that made its way to the Sundance Film Festival, all while you were at the Santa Fe Indian School, living in Santa Fe. That also helped out with my film experience as well, because I had a film class there. And um, I was 16 when I was hired to work on a feature film. I was a director's assistant and that was Drunk Town's Finest. So I was still in high school and it was just like awesome to be in film class and be like, I'm working, I worked on a film. I worked on a feature film over the summer and it was great. And my teacher was so sweet about it. He was just like really impressed. And then when the film got to Sundance and when it was approved, um, he was really supportive about that. He was like, wow, a Sundance film. That's great. Yay. And, you know, I wasn't a part of the creative body on it necessarily. Um, But it was just nice to know that I I had that support in a school where they would push us to focus on academics and not really go into art. It was very 
It was very interesting. Yeah, there's layers to this because one is that you were in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is basically like a big art capital. And then you're going to a Santa Fe Indian school, which wasn't really pushing you in the direction of art, but you were interested in that field. And then there's layers to the education system too, because you were Comanche, a tall Comanche at a Pueblo school, basically, even though it's called Santa Fe Indian school. And on top of that, you were queer. So there was a lot of like layers to this whole educational experience you have that that sort of built you up to who you are today? I would say so. <laughs> yeah, but I want to unpack that. Like, I want to unpack who you are because you're, you're doing a lot of amazing work. You're doing a lot of cool stuff. And to get there to the big conversation, we sort of have to lay some of the foundational stuff down first. So after your Santa Fe experience and everything you've done there, you decided to go to school in San, San Francisco at the Academy of Art, of Art University. Um, well, how was that? Like, what was the jump going from there to San Francisco, then deciding to go to um, art school in a big city on the West Coast? I had always wanted to go to a big city for school. That was something I've always dreamt of. I remember watching movies and seeing people go to live in cities. And that was something I've always wanted to do. And I just knew that it would be the right move because I felt a lot of the time that Santa Fe was never my home. You know, I felt like... It wasn't somewhere I belong, somewhere that I could feel comfortable and recognize as a place of home, even though I knew that my ancestors have been there and traveled to Santa Fe and loved it. Which is another whole podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a whole another podcast. We, we, we won't go there in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we, we will not. But, <laughs> but, you know, I thought it was just so interesting to go, I had applied to every school, every film school I wanted to go to, I've ever dreamt of. So UCLA, NYU, and um, I applied to American Film Institute as well. I think I even, I just went all out in my college applications and I ended up doing every college application by myself. So I was like picking schools left and right. <laughs> I applied to different campuses for UCLA and I came across Academy of Art University. I applied and honestly, that was the only school I got into. All I had rejection from all my other schools, all my other dream schools. And wow. so I just told my mom one day, I was like, hey, I'm going to go to San Francisco for a week. And she said, okay, when? And I had just bought my flight. I was like, tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> she said, okay. And she said, I, <laughs> and she said, okay. And I just left. I went for a week and walked around the city, got to explore. I um, mm -hmm. found out how expensive it was within like that week of <laughs> trip. And being yeah. out there right away, I felt I felt so comfortable. I was like, damn, this is where I need to be. I said, this is where I want to live for a while, if possible. And I got accepted. I got accepted and. I just left. <laughs> yeah, so you just up and left Santa Fe. I just Fe. up and left Santa Fe. I didn't really say goodbye. I was like, well, this was fun. I'm going to go. And <laughs> what was so interesting about being out in San Francisco was, oh my God, I could not have found a place that was more tailored to me as a person. It was fun. It was queer. And there was a wonderful Native community out there. And there were powwows so often it was just like a dream and I met some really I had a lot of friends I met a lot of wonderful people out there and people that I can still call my friend today and it was just eye-opening and to be at a place where you feel 100% accepted and you can actually work on what you want to do is life-changing you have it just takes an extra push and I actually just graduated mm -hmm. yesterday officially via yeah. online. So <laughs> Yeah, so so we're recording this podcast on December nineteenth, which means you graduated on December eighteenth and we're launching this in the new year, but now you're a graduate. You're an art graduate, so cool. Yeah. Woohoo. I did it. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, like, I, to be fair to our audience, I guess we got to take a step back and, and say why and highlight why having a conversation about Comanches in Santa Fe would have to be a whole other podcast is because your people also traditionally were in that area. 
and you weren't in the area on the nicest of terms with other people. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so it, I guess it makes sense why I was bullied at a pub, at a public school. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because these stories are still alive, right? Like these stories of of your people coming in there at that time, early on, even, um, and like you know, before modern times, I think it would have been like pre Spanish contact, technically speaking. Yeah, and and it's so interesting because a lot of the people out here, like people in high school that I went to, knew these stories. Like they do not forget. So <laughs> they say, "Where are you?" They would ask me. They would say, "Where are you from? What pub? What pueblo are you from?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm Comanche." And they would just turn their back and not even talk to me for the rest of the year. <laughs> we heard about you people. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really cool to also position, though, even though like we're, we're positioning and highlighting like the fact that you also went to like an Indian school, an indigenous school. Um, you're an indigenous person, but there's also layers to these experiences of even having an indigenous school. There's even layers of history and there's even layers of even your own identity in terms of being queer and, and being comanche in a territory so there's like so much overlap here that that is really interesting to see and also i want to position that and highlight that as part of who you are thank you thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah you did go to san francisco for university you were in that space what was your major what did you major so i majored in? in the motion pictures television department of screenwriting so i majored in screenwriting essentially and i had also worked as a ta for cinematography for the cinematography department so i was um helping in um undergrad and graduate cinematography classes so that was definitely fun and definitely has helped my writing process as a screenwriter and has helped me as a director understand our sets a little easier and just like who to talk to how to get what i want in an image but it also helped pay my tuition <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actively having to like find jobs, to just live in San Francisco, right? Because you said earlier, it's not it's not a cheap place to yeah, live. No, it's not. It's like five dollars for a bottle of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So also, I mean, on top of you being um, like just a university student or a college student going off to art school, um, which is a challenge in itself. And a lot of our listeners are like undergraduates who made their way to this podcast. Um, so a lot of young people take that jump and leave home and leave their comfort zone and go do what they want to do. Um, and sometimes it's not easy. Like sometimes conflict comes up, challenges happen. What was one challenge that you faced in school that, that, that sort of came up for you and how did you deal with that? Oh, geez. There were challenges every semester to be completely honest, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, being graduated now and looking back at the past five years, it took me five years to get through my undergrad because of finances. And, you know, my, I don't come from a rich family, of course, and being in filmmaking and being indigenous, the scholarships are really small. So I think if anything, um, the biggest challenges throughout all these years is finances and yeah. looking for scholarships. Like you have to really nitpick sometimes if you are in a particular major, do your best to find as many scholarships for that and apply to all of them. Yeah, It would never hurt. Yeah. And were there like any personal struggles that came up for you that almost swayed you from completing your program there? One of the biggest issues that I had and one of the biggest problems was going through a horrible breakup to a point where it made me want to drop out of school. And it was just this huge whole kind of scandal, honestly. It was just involving, may I spill the tea? Can I spill the tea on this? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, want. I will spill yeah. the tea on this. So it was just pretty much like uh, I was cheated on. I was cheated on by someone that I had. So I was dating this guy that I met out in San Francisco. And I was like, okay, nothing horrible can happen because like you don't really know much about me. But then he somehow got with my ex from New Mexico. Yeah, this is crazy. So I was like, I was like, what in the hell? I was like, oh, geez. I was like, okay, I'm officially in a soap opera. And <laughs> yeah. that had made me want to quit school because I was like, how could something so bad happen? Like, how could someone 
how can an ex from New Mexico follow me out here and ruin my life and ruin my life with someone that like I didn't even have connections to at home with? Like I, I don't get it. But yeah. Well, thanks for talking about this because I think this is a dynamic for that age demographic and undergrads where relationships do fall apart. Um, relationships are made and it's a tender time where like a lot of young people are learning to do things and, and, and experience life. So yeah, these, these, this is like a form of trauma for you. And for me in my field, I realize that some of these traumas that young people um experience and students experience in general sometimes sway them from their studies like they'll they'll leave university or they'll leave college and have to take time for themselves but but you didn't you stayed in there um what was the turning point that started to get you out of this this um negative space that you were in um that potentially could have you know ultimately um sabotaged your your university program your college program I remember crying and just being so upset and I was crying in front of my cinematography professor and he's this five, two Italian cinematographer. He's like built, he works out and he's really mean. He's got a rough, deep voice. And I started crying in his office and he just looked at me. He didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I said, I was, I was like, I don't think I want to be here anymore. I was like, I think I just want to leave and do like online classes. I said, I don't think I can deal with this right now. And he looked at me, he's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And I was like, why? I said, it'd be cheaper too. I said, I wouldn't have to worry about housing. And he just looked at me, he was like, no, he's like, you will not let this defeat you. He was like, are you kidding me? He was like, don't you dare give this up for someone who treated you so horribly. He was like, that doesn't make sense. He was like, why do you, why should you leave for someone who treated you like that? He was like, never settle for that. He was like, just keep being yourself. He was like, and if you need, he was like, and of course, I'll always be here for you. And that was something that was also nice and reassuring. So I would say if you're an undergrad, don't get in relationships. Just kidding. <laughs> I think everybody gives that advice. Like everyone who's completed an undergrad and congratulations on completing the undergrad and getting to that point where there's this hindsight clarity and then with that hindsight clarity, everybody who graduates is like, yeah, I shouldn't have gotten into that relationship, which is really solid advice. <laughs> That's really solid <laughs> advice to give. Yeah, it is. Because yeah. How can you take care of yourself and also like keep someone else in mind of like care and comfort and someone could just easily destroy you? <laughs> Yeah, and like college relationships at that point in my life, when I, when I even look back at mine, they're they're based on like going through the struggle. They're based on you living a life of of having to meet the semester, having to meet your financial needs. So they're kind of like a very high energy type of relationship. So when they break down, it's it's it, it could be devastating. And I think in hindsight, when we get past that whole you know university phase or college phase, uh, like you did with your graduation, hindsight kicks in, and you're like, yeah, that was a lot of emotional energy that i didn't have to expend when i should just concentrate on my studies i was about to say and don't let that be a thing don't let someone else ruin you for no reason yeah just be strong yeah. you got this yeah. and then you're also in a place of where you're learning so there's also like a, even a level of vulnerability because you're open to learning you're outside of your comfort zone and for a lot of people that's exciting but you know sometimes you know issues happen like you highlighted and it was it was all almost devastating for you but you did have a strong comeback game and you persevered and now you got that degree yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so let's say the only yeah. four you should worry about is your in your gpa <laughs> yeah yeah. So what was your GPA? I'm just kidding. You don't have to answer. I that. didn't even check. <laughs> I just like, last <laughs> night I was at the studio and um, they were like, congrats, you graduated on my email. And I was like, cool. And my professor <laughs> sent me back my final I was like, can you edit this? I was like, are you kidding me? It is eight o'clock. I am trying to go home after production. I was like, oh, so I sat there and edited my homework and then <laughs> <laughs> the director of the production was about to leave and he's going back to Mexico City. And he was like, what are you still doing here? I'm leaving. I said, I know, but I have my last final. And he was like, well, let me look at it. I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, thank you. 
<laughs> but you know, I didn't even check. I'm like so scared right now. <laughs> I just like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. Okay. Whatever yeah. happens, happens. Well, you got the email, you graduated. You got the email, you graduated. <laughs> I did. I was like, well, mom, you're looking at a graduated person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool though. But yeah, you're actively working on a film final while working on a film set. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like another thing because I was feeling really depressed about my graduation. I was like, this is so mm -hmm. sad. I've worked so hard just to get like an online link, click the link and my name's on a list. I was like, is that it? I didn't get like virtual confetti. And I was <laughs> feeling very depressed about that. And I thought about, it. I was standing there on, I was standing there in the studio and I was like, you know what? No, this is where I need to be because if I told, myself four years ago that I would be on an Amazon production working mm -hmm. and not doing my virtual graduation. I'm pretty sure myself from four years ago would have been like, that's a good idea. You're doing great. We're doing awesome. We did it. Yeah. And I think yeah. that was really comforting because I mean, technically I graduated and went through learning about film to be in film and that's what I'm doing. So <laughs> It's yeah. really yeah. awesome. I'm I'm not bothered by my virtual graduation. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, and you're there. You're there. You're definitely like up and coming and and we're going to talk about your film here shortly. Um but jumping back to art school, what were like what what are common traps to avoid? Not only, well, not only in university but also like in art school specifically because art school is like a different type of like a different type of beast, I find. Yeah, it really is because everyone's so open and we're putting ourselves in spaces where we're being creative and we're working on our craft and we're perfecting it. And at the same time, we're growing too as people. And I think that's something to, um, I'm going to say some things that you should do in art school, because I feel like there's a lot of things that you could avoid, you know, but the things that you should do in art school is get out of your comfort zone. Try things that are different. Meet different people. I think one of the best things I've ever gotten out of our school is the wide range and different personalities of friends that I have. Like everyone has their own different creative process, but they're all just so different. And I would definitely say to accept the fact that you're always growing and so is your art. And if you take care of yourself what you're working on will take care of you in return i know it sounds kind of crazy but it really will and just to keep pushing even if you think that you're not having good ideas just keep working just keep going because something will pop up and it'll look wonderful when you're finished with it <laughs> yeah yeah, that's great advice. That's great advice for anybody who's in like post-secondary or university or college. And then, yeah, like even for me, I went to an art school, even though I did the academic track, I initially went down to be a creative writer. Um, and um, that didn't pan out. I had a choice to do creative writing or jump into indigenous liberal studies. And I finally made the decision to do indigenous liberal studies. And now I'm doing my PhD in academia stuff. But art school was like emotions ran high in art school, creative creativity ran high and that was a really unique process i think that influenced my work was being around artists being in the studio you know till midnight and chilling and talking story and seeing artists be creative and edit films and even being asked to act in the senior projects and things like that being <laughs> being asked to act in the film students movies so there's like probably little cheesy movies out there that i'm in oh i love it <laughs> that are yeah. in the official I, I archive yeah, maybe. So yeah, I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts, but I think even some are uploaded on Facebook. I think my <laughs> friend Keith Grosbeck probably has a few of his old films he asked me to to act in where he had to do his like cinematography shots and get all these angles in his assignment and stuff like that. And yeah, <laughs> it was a fun experience. Like art school, I, I wouldn't change it for anything because it was an amazing space and environment to do my undergrad in. But all that advice you're giving is really sound and really... um. It's needed. So a lot of young students, especially in COVID times, need that motivation and need some insight and support to figure out how to stay motivated and get through the struggle. Definitely. Yeah. So you're a filmmaker. You do film. You went to school for film. You're actively working on a set right now. I feel like I want to ask, first and foremost, before we start to talk about film, 
and mm-hmm. how you view film and things like that. What are some films you like and who are the filmmakers you like? Oh my gosh. Ooh, <laughs> that's like, that's the worst question. Okay. I'm just going to be, <laughs> that's like the worst question uh, yeah. because I feel like there's so many people that I like, but you know, on top of, I actually have a list and I pulled out this list because I had a <laughs> feeling you were going to ask. That. <laughs> <laughs> I really love Tom Ford. I love Tom mm-hmm. Ford's films. So he did uh, A Single Man and um, Nocturnal Animals. Those are the two films that he's really directed so far. But I love his style and how he brings color and his background of fashion because he's a fashion designer. And I just love how he brings in everything that he's into and everything that he loves into one medium. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate that because I feel like with films, people are like, oh, this one person likes this. So we're going to see a lot of this in it. Or for example, you might watch a filmmaker and say, okay, they like a lot of Tarantino, obviously, because they're doing Tarantino like things. But I think Tom Ford just manages to bring in every element of film, every aspect, color, visuals, um, even music. He picks the greatest, um, composers for his soundtrack i also loved um gregory nava he directed selena and wrote the screenplay for frida Mm -hmm. i loved his work because of course selena is something that i grew up with my sister was obsessed with selena so i ended up learning the whole history about her whether i liked it or not (laughs) (laughs) but the selena movie watching the selena movie always is such an emotional experience Mm -hmm. and i think this director managed to like tie in the right elements to make it so impactful for young people. Like if you watch it, it's kind of got like this wonder to it, like this youthful child, almost childlike wonder to it. Mm -hmm. It makes you dream. It makes you uh, feel hopeful. And I feel like the way he directed that was just absolutely beautiful. And of course, as an indigenous person, Taika Waititi. Yeah, I think everyone's <laughs> familiar with Taika Waititi. If they're not, then they should be. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely should be. Uh, watching Boy for the first time was just heartbreaking, but beautiful at the same time. Yeah. He just has he has mastered the art of happy sad, mm-hmm. and you know, just like bringing in all the right emotional elements. So I love his work definitely for sure but i also like a lot of um old movies like old hollywood 1940s films yeah i'm really into um vintage and really into history so i find myself watching a lot of black and white films yeah yeah that's really cool then also like one th- key thing i think i would really want our audience to take away from this is you're talking about filmmakers and you're talking about technique you're not talking about actors per se No, because actors are great. They're wonderful. They help bring the vision to life, but they're going off of what is in script. Yeah. And they're taking that and they're digesting it in their own way. Yeah. And, you know, it's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. I like to say that filmmaking isn't really an art because art is something that you tend to do by yourself. It's a medium that you have direct contact with. Yeah. Um, filmmaking is a collaboration. You bring on other artists to work with you and to help make this piece what it should be. Yeah. It's like a big puzzle. For sure. Yeah, that's really cool how you said that because there is a big like shift and pull to get like um like get people of color in film, obviously, and get like native actors out there and actresses out there and and you know, even like queer actresses and actors out there who aren't necessarily even in these conversations right now. Um, but I feel like that's just the surface level, you know what I mean? Because it's like the actors and, and people in front of the screen are awesome, but there's so much that goes into production and there's so much creative elements that are needed to to get to that product. I feel the same way with that. I feel like, you know, the more Native creatives we have, the more Native the film and future films yeah. will be. Like we can normalize that indigenous people have actual stories and narratives and same experiences and we can all just collaborate and work together. Currently I'm the only indigenous person in this production office who is not an executive. The um, executive, her name is Heather Ray and she's native and she's helping out with a project, but it's only two of us. 
And if you were to look at like the list of crew, there's probably like two, like a hundred, a hundred people. So it's two out of a hundred, you know, out of a hundred. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting because there's so much elements that go into film. And I do feel like there is like this pull. I mean, I guess I could say like, there's this YouTube generation, you know, there's like this influencer generation influenced by Instagram and YouTube and, and just Hollywood big cinema to the point of where they assume like, oh, actors are awesome. Let's get actors out there. We need more actors. But then it's like, there's a gear house behind there. And that's sort of like where you're immersed in is, is, is actually not necessarily in front of the house, but in the back of the house where the, the, the magic tends to happen to, to get to that, like, um, person on the screen. Um, what's Taika's, what's this new series coming out with Taika Waititi that he's directing? He's directing a Star Wars movie, but, oh no, it's, um, is it Reservation Dogs yeah. with Sterling yeah. Harjo? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's what's unique about that film, Reservation Dogs with Taika Waititi, is that there's actually like a back of the house crew that's involved in, in directing that film and, and getting that film going, which is why it's turning a lot of heads right now. Yeah. And that's also something else that's very interesting too, is that the native film community is just beautiful and it's tight knit Mm -hmm. to a point where everyone just helps each other. And I know that Sterling and uh, Taika have known each other for years, you know, starting with their days back in Sundance. And I feel like even the people that I've started with in Sundance, because when I was, um, Sundance film festival, Sundance (laughs) film festival. Yes. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've just been like hanging around a bunch of film people. So like, the actual, <laughs> you know, I have to say the whole thing. Everyone's like, oh, okay. <laughs> These conversations might be new to our audience who's from like uh, rural Saskatchewan, things like that. But yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so Sundance Film Festival has always been kind of a starting point for Indigenous filmmakers to get together and to work on different ideas, to... um further their stories. And I actually started with Sundance Film Festival as well in their um, screenwriting programs that they did. They did a workshop and they sometimes, they do sometimes indigenous workshops because they have a really wonderful indigenous program. I know that, you know, being within uh, this community, within Sundance's native film community, I feel that I get to kind of experience history. And I know seeing like Sterling and Taika and even the executive producer on this uh, on this series that I'm working on with Amazon, Heather, it's just incredible to see like where we've started and where they are now, and how even myself, I started back in 2015, I think, with a fellowship. It's called the for the Full Circle Fellowship, and then doing the uh, Filmmakers Lab, and seeing where I am now, and like even some of the people that were in the fellowship with me, like it's crazy how close we are and just down to help each other. And I think that's something that I was very happy to see when I heard about Reservation Dogs. I saw a picture of um, Sterling and Taika, and just like knowing all the names behind the projects because they essentially we've all essentially like grown up with each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really cool, and it is true to say that like Indian country gets smaller the more disciplined you get because the more disciplined you get in your career or field, there's going to be other natives there and Indian country smaller. You're going to start to know names and and know each other. Um, Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. And there's lots to this. Like there's lots to this gear house that goes into making films. And I find that grassroots community in general kind of just gets caught up on actors and actresses, but there's a lot of amazing people in film doing amazing things. and, And I would like to highlight them more importantly, because the writing attracts me, cinematography attracts me, and and directing attracts me more so than acting, so to speak. And that's something I wanted to highlight is is that there's there's bigger conversations like Reservation Dogs is unique because there are indigenous films out there that have a strong backhouse crew, but I mean it's just like it's starting to see how this is starting to get momentum, and even that's why Taika Waititi's work is so like um, profound for a lot of indigenous people. He's everybody's uncle because it's like he's coming at it from the perspective of of being indigenous and having like that indigenous lens and it's subtle. It's there. Like you said, how he had, he mastered happy and sad and that's evident in his humor. And um, yeah, it's sort of like all coming together to see like a whole new wave of indigenous media that is inherently to the core indigenous. I think indigenous film and indigenous media starts with indigenous people. It always will never, because I mean, whale rider, for example, that's not an indigenous film. 
it has indigenous actors, yes, and maybe some uh, cultural supervisors and creatives, but it's not written by an indigenous person. It's not directed by indigenous people. And indigenous film begins with indigenous mm-hmm. directors, producers, writers, and even editors. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really glad you said that because that that is like a go to film for a lot of people who 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 tend to assume that because there's brown actors or there's indigenous actors that it is an indigenous film. But when you actually like lift the veil and you even see the writers and things like that, it's not. It's it's like the classic you know like Wild West genre, which I guess we could talk about now. Was that there is like the Indian cinema, there's like the Hollywood cinema. I think Real Engines, a documentary, a lot of people <laughs> could look into if they haven't watched it. They probably should. <laughs> Because it sort of does highlight like that early era of filmmaking where indigenous people are the um, indigenous people are like the filler in movies that sort of aren't necessarily like indigenous films whatsoever. They're just like the backdrop or, you know, the the content that often is very stereotyped. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, we're really unpacking indigenous film and and and. Um, multimedia in general and I and I really want our audience to sort of get the feel of, of what you do as a filmmaker in terms of back of the house stuff and um, how much intention goes into this and how there's a whole background involved in just you know getting movies to the screen um, but for you as a filmmaker because you're giving us a lot of insights and a lot of things to think about but for you as a filmmaker and emerging filmmaker who do you identify as your audience like in your mind who are you making a film for and why that's a really interesting question because I was taught and advised to think about numbers, to think about people as numbers and how many people will come in and see a certain film. But I've always thought in like, in my heart, I've always thought and I've always known that I'd be making films for indigenous people, for indigenous people, for women, for my fellow non-binary folks. How y'all doing? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you know just for indigenous youth too i've always wanted to write films and to write films about native native youth and what it's like to have in a sad sense kind of a safe happy environment yeah i remember my one of my short films that i'm working on right now i'm doing a different project it's about creating safe spaces and being comfortable and being yourself. And I felt like that's something I never had before. So I've always wanted to write experiences for other indigenous people to learn and to love and to recognize Mm -hmm. as something that is our experience and that should be experiences as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Definitely on point with that. And I think like film in general for like, even for me as like a native kid from the res going into town to see a film was such a big deal. Like I, for some reason, like we love film just because it was a way for us to, to sort of disconnect from like some of the issues we have at home, some of the issues in our community. And, and yeah, like some of my best memories with my late father and my family were all jumping in the van and going to town to see a movie and then having to share popcorn with your cousins and brothers and sisters and, and (laughs) things like that. So yeah, there's definitely like this indigenous space in film. Like we're an audience and that we, we do um, view and respect the genre of like, of, well, not the genre, but like the infrastructure that goes into film. I don't know what it's called infrastructure. I don't know. (laughs) But (laughs) but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah. Yeah. And you know, I've never met, I've met so many different people in my life so far, my small time being alive. And I have never met people who reference movies as much as native people. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be hanging, you'd be hanging out there. Um, and someone, you know, you'd be, your leg falls asleep or something and you're trying to stand up and you limp or something. And someone references something to a movie yeah. and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> or they'd be like, Oh, you and I think, you know, that's a goal of mine is to have Native people reference my movie. Yeah. <laughs> that would be like ultimate peak true. of my career. Yeah, that, that is true. <laughs> because, I mean, and, you know, even with that, that was something I was always upset with because growing up, Native boys had Victor and Thomas and mm. Indigenous, you know, Native girls. We had Pocahontas, yeah. like, or 
parents would buy us Pocahontas things. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's like, when will that ever change? When will there ever be a movie of just Native women, you know, being themselves and not being someone's auntie, someone's mom, mm. someone's grandma? Like, when will we actually pass the um, Bechdel test wow. <laughs> in media? Yeah. Are you familiar no. with the Bechdel no, test? Uh, let's unpack what that so is. The Be- Okay, so the Bechdel test, this is something that a lot of people use like in film theory and studying films. It's called Bechdel, B-E-C-H-D-E-L, and test. So it's a um, format in like media to measure the representation of women in narratives. Mm -hmm. So it kind of challenges a film or a book, whatever, And it asks whether a work features two women who talk to each other about something other than a man. Mm -hmm. And the other requirement is a woman must have a name. Like if you go through the credits, she just can't be like um, main character's girlfriend or woman number one, woman number two. And I see that a lot in indigenous film, unfortunately. And that frustrates me because that's something that, I want to break. I want native girls to have something that they can watch and be like, that's me. Or I know that person. Yeah. That's my cousin. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. just to have something to hold on to. Yeah. It's interesting you said that because I didn't even connect the dots until you said that young native boys had like Victor and Thomas. And that's sort of like a boys will be boys narrative where these are like, you know, now characters in, in Indian country. And then, yeah. And, there's almost like this assumption of like native women just being the auntie or being the caregiver. And even, I guess like that even extends to non-binary, even queer representation in films. Like I don't even, I'm trying to connect dots in my mind on the fly of where we see those, that in in indigenous media today. I don't think we do. (laughs) Do we? (laughs) No, no, not really. I mean, there is a film called fire song Um, and that features kind of like, but it's still, it's still not a representation of queer people yeah. because it's, you know, a straight person questioning their identity and whether they want to be mm. with this person, with this gay person, this person who's comfortable in their own sexuality. Yeah. And that movie has a lot of trauma and, you know, suicide and even rape within mm. it. So it doesn't represent, in my personal opinion, it doesn't represent native people or native queer people. And I remember watching it for the first time and it really made me sad because I was, I was excited. I was like, yay, native queer film. I was like, yes, it's the time. And I watched it and I was like, this doesn't make me feel good. Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I'm wrapping around, like I'm, (laughs) I'm loving this conversation with you because I'm wrapping my head around certain things too, because like one of the dynamics I always say is I can't watch historical documentaries about residential school and it just triggers me. And I mean, I, I do like, I have to build up the momentum to actually watch movies and like, I can't watch movies that depict, um, um, trauma like even like the beginning of hidalgo the disney movie where where they show the wounded knee massacre i can't watch that like like it, it bugs me like i still don't watch that part of the movie and i think i only watched the film three times but when mm-hmm. i first saw it i was like yeah i don't like this and it kind of just leaves it like as like this big cliffhanger emotional cliffhanger for us because none of that's resolved and it's just like okay that happened here's the trauma here's the dynamic and i guess that would like make a lot of sense for somebody who identifies as queer to see these these topics touched on but even just in general like documentary is is often just highlights poverty or highlights like the political and social issues that that we face and doesn't necessarily really resolve much um so yeah you putting into context mm-hmm. like that makes a lot of sense yeah you're giving i, I just know like people who will listen to this their gears are going to be thinking about things what is what is your goal then like when with 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 if that's the case where you're seeing like a lack of representation of indigenous women and indigenous queer folks in film what is tell us about like what you try to achieve through your style your methods and your perspective and your films because now after this question we'll jump into what your film is of course what I try to show through my films and through my vision and just overall stories is normalization. Mm-hmm. I want indigenous people to watch this and to normalize concepts of 
indigenous women being on screen and not being used as scapegoats to the plot, meaning someone gets hurt, someone gets raped, someone goes missing or something of that sort. Um, I want to show queer people as well and to show like good examples of queer people and how we recognize and love queer people within our communities and how they are so loving and how they're so sweet and just good people and have lives, very interesting lives as well. Because sometimes you watch a film, indigenous or not, you watch a film and they're always like, Oh, that's, you know, so-and-so they don't really have kids or anything like that. So that's that. It's like, no, (laughs) no. Or they're like, this is my gay best friend. It's like, no, we're so much more than just your gay best friend. Mm -hmm. We have our own stories. You ain't a main character. You the side character, you know? <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. And there's, it's, it's like, it's also not like, it, it's not also implicit. Like I'm thinking like the devil wears Prada where, which his name uh, was like not positioned as the gay best friend, but obviously was like the gay best friend. Does that make sense? Yes. And there's a yeah. lot of that in nineties, like TV shows and a lot Rom-com. of movies, rom-coms yeah. where they're like, Oh, you know, if things don't end well, I'll marry you. It's like, yeah. no, I want to marry who I want to marry. Okay. Yeah. Not you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I think with my films, I just want to normalize that. I want to normalize seeing indigenous queer people on screen and for other, and to actually capture how other people act towards yeah. queer people. Because I feel like every time you watch a film, a queer person's always being made fun of, yeah. you know, and Yes, it still happens within Native communities today, but it's the times are different now. Yeah. We're slowly coming coming out and being more comfortable with ourselves, and that's something that I want to show on my mm-hmm. films for other people who might be uncomfortable, like young people who might just be questioning and they might not know about themselves, but if they see a good representation on screen, if they see someone that they could call a family member or know yeah. as a family member on screen, I think it will help. Yeah. And then like you highlighted something interesting too, where you want to position um, not only female, but, but also um, queer folks in terms of just already being transitioned to being who they are, not necessarily going through that struggle or highlighting like almost like the borderline, I don't know what to call it. Like in documentary, it would be like poverty porn. But yes. almost like this transition yes. phase that always seems to be like the topic of discussion in, in a lot of multimedia methods. Um, yeah. So yeah, to get that end product of, of somebody who's there, who's strong and resilient, it sounds like what that, like if I were to sum up what you're saying, that sounds like what you were, you're achieving to get. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what I want to do. Yeah. And I'm, t- of course I'm tired of poverty porns and narratives and, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, I get it. I guess I get it in documentary making a mm-hmm. poverty porn. Sure. But if you get to write your own script, why the hell are you writing about al- alcoholic dads? Yeah. Why are we still talking about this? Why are we still talking about poverty porn? Why are we still talking about our struggles? Yeah. It's like you have creative control and that's what you choose to write about. <laughs> Yeah. It's very upsetting for me because True. as and you know, and I'm more of what people would call quote unquote an urban Indian, but mm-hmm. we exist. We're in cities. We have iPhones. Like yeah. we're not always just struggling and there's so many stories to be told with that. Yeah. And it's like, it's an autonomous choice, right? To be who you are and to embrace and, and embody who you are, which is a decolonial act. And like, yeah, how you said, like, why is it like for me as, as a, well, let me put it this way because I'm not necessarily a creative writer right now, but it makes sense as to why somebody would want to write or choose to write about such a very traumatic experience in their life and then put that on the screen and and expose that to the world like there's something going on there that is doesn't like seem like it's um legitimate and well not legitimate but doesn't seem like it's safe and also like the fact that there's a market and like an economy and a structure that facilitates that type of film creation i think is also something that's pretty problematic that needs to be highlighted too Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Definitely. Which means that, yeah, which means that the audience for those films may not necessarily be our own people. Like for me, like I don't watch the poverty porn stuff. I don't watch trauma stuff or things that will trigger me. But I love like Taika Waititi's Hunt for the Wilder People. <laughs> like I'll watch that time <laughs> and time again. And he is talking about like child welfare in there, right? He's talking about somebody who doesn't have, have parents. But like he said, he mastered that, that sad, happy narrative and those constructs where he's even unpacking like the social worker. Like it's a, it's a silly caricature for people to see and he's deconstructing and removing that fear of of child welfare in the hunt for wilder people and in a very comedic way where you could laugh at that and it sort of does relieve release some of that like tension that we have around that system in particular i find with that film in particular this, this sort of comes out really clear i think so as well i think he just has a way of writing you know like you literally everything yes to everything you just unpacked yes yes and yes <laughs> <laughs> you can't always agree with me pishan <laughs> shook <laughs> shook but like no what you said is true it's honest yeah. it's true and it's honest and you know and the fact that you he even has an indigenous character in yes. the film but doesn't say my character is indigenous here's yeah him dancing, doing some ceremonial mm-hmm. song. Here's him uh, wearing his hair in braids or something like that. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes, my character is indigenous. This is the war of what's happening in his personal life. And it happens to a lot of people within mm-hmm. the country and even within his people, within his like yeah. um, indigenous culture. But so what? It's like, we don't need to make a big deal of indigenous characters being on screen it's like quit putting us in jean jackets and give us the yeah. story that we deserve <laughs> yeah i don't even own a jean jacket <laughs> so why exactly. is there always a character with a jean jacket <laughs> oh my, i'm not gonna lie i had a um i was doing a i was doing a press thing and they wanted me i'm not gonna get too much into detail but they asked if i had a jean jacket and i was like no i don't and yeah. they said do you have any earrings i said i have my earrings that i love to wear which is happens to be native style dentilium mm. long earrings that my mom yeah. makes i was like but i'm not putting on a jean jacket and wearing fringe for you sorry yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there's layers to these conversations and i'm really i'm really grateful and thank you for the time to help unpack some of this and lay some of this out and um obviously we're not gonna like you know be able to unpack everything but i, I wanted to touch on some of the things we touched on and i'm glad we did but i want to get to like the capstone of this podcast which is basically you have a film that's coming out and in your film the daily life of mistress red um the main character is a dominatrix for hire who takes the effects of racism sexism and colonization into her own hands by educating white supremacists through pleasures like through through their their kink so tell us about your film that's coming up because this is some this this does a lot. This film is doing a lot and it's unpacking a lot of, you know, perspective and and putting a lot out there for people to think about and reflect on. So how did this idea come about and 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 what's the goal with this film? This I, this film came out of pure anger. I'm going to be 100% with you. Cool. <laughs> it came out of frustration, it came out of anger, but it also came out of acceptance and it also came out of love and um love my love for my culture and my people and every, every indigenous person listening to this, it came out of love for y'all. And I remember I was at Sundance film festival and it was before I, I didn't have anything in the, actually, no, you know what I did? I'm sorry. I was at Sundance film festival and I was there uh-huh. for a documentary on Scott Mama day called words from a bear. I had done mm-hmm. cinematography on that and it was during the time of Trump and everything of that sort. And people were obviously talking about it. And um, there was a women's uh, march that happened in the middle of the road. And I was on social media the same day. And I happened to see um, people posting about the Trump supporters who were mocking a indigenous man singing Uh, on um, the steps of the Capitol, I think it was. I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember seeing that and just being like, okay. And then I also remember seeing some of my friends' posts on social media about how they were at the Women's March in Washington, D.C., and white women were actively ignoring Indigenous women. 
and not really including them in the quote unquote feminist movement. And that was something that upset me too. And I was like, how come they get to wear pink hats and not like look at indigenous women going missing and being murdered and you know, all that. I was like, what the hell? And so I also thought about this too, because I had talked to some of my friends at one point and they're dominatrixes. They are sex workers and they're proud. And we were talking one time and we were just like, well, what do we do? Like, about white men and about people being horrible because one of my Latinx friends, uh, her client screamed, build the wall in the middle of flagellation. Mm -hmm. And she didn't know what to do. She didn't, she was like, okay, well, I just ended the session. I didn't know what to do. She was like, I just, that was it. She was like, and then he said, make America great again during another session. And she was like, okay, we have a problem. (laughs) And, and so I just thought about it and I was like, well, damn, I really wish I could, with these white men Mm -hmm. for all indigenous people. I was like, I wish I could just go out there and do that. And I just created mistress red. Yeah. I was flying home to Sanford. I was flying back to San Francisco and I wrote down, it's a short film by the way. And I wrote down 11 pages all in one go. And that's within two hours. And from there, I just closed my laptop and waited to write the ending. Mm. And two weeks later, I came back to it and I wrote the ending for it. And I read it again and I was honestly happy of what I wrote. I wrote a film about a native dominatrix who whips uh, white supremacists Mm -hmm. and who open, who is being, it's a mockumentary. So she's being documented by a indigenous um, women's power vlog is what the title Mm -hmm. is. And she's taking this character named Taylor on a journey of sex work and being sex positive and what it's like to be indigenous and to be within that space. And I felt like this was something that native women need to have a conversation Mm -hmm. on. We are always told, Oh, wear something different. Your uncles are coming around or, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, why should we fix ourselves in something that is so natural? Why should we be ashamed of something that's so natural? And I also feel like sex has always been something that's been used against native people. Mm. It's been used to hurt us for so many years. Yeah. And I feel that writing about sex and showing sex and even sex work on screen is just something I wanted to do. It's cool to see how like this concept that you've developed and 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 even like Mistress Red, like this this character who who I'm visualizing as doing a lot and being like socially aware and even um obviously like aware of sexuality and and kink and things like that and and being super mindful of like how she's going about intentionally deconstructing these things. Um, it's really interesting to see how this character can do that and and is doing that, and I'm looking forward to seeing the film. Um, But what is the one key thing you want your audience to take away from the film when it's released? Because it's still in post-production, so it's not out yet, but it's coming out. Yes, it is coming out. (laughs) I think there's so many things that I want everyone to take from this. I want Native women to walk out feeling powerful as hell. I want them to feel strong and to feel like there's someone on their side and even for native sex workers as well. Like I want them to feel safe and that they are heard and that someone will tell stories about them. And that's something I always want indigenous people to know is that there's someone out there who wants to listen to your narrative, who wants to listen to your stories and it will, it will be me. (laughs) Also for indigenous people with this film, I just want them to understand that it's okay. It's okay to not understand everything right away. It's okay to take your time. It's okay to grow and to love yourself, to love your body and just get to know yourself and just to be happy. There's so many things I want to say with this film. And even for like my native queer people, my mistress Red actually has a partner and I actively show a queer relationship and um, that's something that I want to be normalized as well. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this film and um, because I want to see, like I'm excited to see how your whole experience, your whole work has sort of accumulated into this film that you're making and, and it's really state. And it's also 
really cool to see you develop into who you are as a filmmaker and continuing to develop into this um this career path that you're on it's really cool to see anything else you want to talk about anything else you want to add of course there's so much to talk about we've been talking for almost an hour and a half and i think most importantly if there's anything i want to talk about it's just um i want to let viewers or listeners sorry Mm -hmm. (laughs) so film oriented uh (laughs) i want to let listeners know that uh i'm always here for you guys we can always connect on instagram i use instagram a lot i'm low-key addicted and if you need resources for film programs you can always let me know you can slide into my dms i'd be happy to help you out because we need more indigenous voices in film in narrative and if you have any thing that you're wanting to go into like editing or um, directing cinematography writing just give it a try you never know you never know what's gonna happen just try it and never be afraid of failing or making or you know just what the product will be because my first short films are very awful and they were on a very poor camera, very bad camera. And you just have to give it a go and just keep practicing on your technique and never be afraid to tell any story because someone's always out there listening and someone always wants to hear that story. That was another thing that like I was conditioned to in school because they were trying to teach us more about the industry side and how to get hired and how to get jobs essentially But with every story I'd pitch about like indigenous people living in the city, for example, they'd be like, okay, but who's your audience? And why do we need to hear this now? Like, why is this important? It's like, it doesn't need to be important. It's a story I want to tell and I will tell it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you said Instagram, if our listeners want to find you, where do they find you on Instagram and anywhere else? They can find me on Instagram at real r e a l p bread p last name bread b r e a d and you can follow my short film and my short film page for updates at mistress red film on instagram awesome great any shout outs you want to give any closing remarks yeah of course i want to give a shout out to my partner and tell him thank you for listening to my film ideas at two in the morning sometimes uh <laughs> I want to shout out my mother and uh, say thank you for just being there and for and that I'm really proud of her for following her dreams of being a producer. And oh, that's another thing. It's never too late to get into film. It's never too late to get into this creative um, medium. My mother is my mother. She's a little older. She's a little older and she took up film producing five years ago and she's doing absolutely wonderful in it now so it's never too late to become a director a screenwriter producer cinematographer it's just doing it and then she's gonna she's gonna share this so there's probably gonna be a bunch of like santa fe community that's gonna listen to this podcast oh my gosh hi (laughs) hi santa fe how you doing (laughs) (laughs) after you're like i left that place Oh, after I was like, I left. I didn't like it. I'm back, baby. How you doing? (laughs) Real, real Indian uncle vibes right now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thanks for sitting down with me. You gave us a lot to think about and unpack. And yeah, great guest for Radical Narrative. And I'm looking forward to what you're going to be doing in the future. And yeah, people will find you. And thanks for coming on. All right. We'll see you later. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye.